It is my pleasure to introduce Dave Warnock. He's the author of the memoir, Childish Things, and will be with us virtually today. Hello. I hope you can hear me. I, uh, this is odd for me. I, I, much, I much prefer being in person there. I'm sure someone will send me a message if you can't hear me, but I do hear myself echoing in the room. But um, yeah, we were planning for me to be there. I've, um, I've been doing a lot of traveling in the last year and a half after since COVID kind of opened things up again. And um, I was going to be traveling uh, and doing some presentations and book signings and things like that, because I did just release my memoir, Childish Things. Um, earlier this year, February, but I have ALS and um, it's a degenerative motor neuron disease, most more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, it has been taking a toll. And so I've had to cut back on traveling and not, not do as many things as I had planned to do and cut. And some of the individual groups that I was going to be with like yours, I've had to cancel and reschedule and just recognize that I can't do the things I used to do and, and want to do. So um, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person. And um, I guess this is the next best thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the book, Childish Things, which is my story in essence. Um, my dying out loud work that I've been doing for the last three and a half years, three years or so. And um, I will have to pause and take a sip from my water because when I speak, the ALS, my, my voice gets tired. So I apologize for that. But it's probably better that you don't have to see it in person. <laughs> um, the ALS, just just for those of you that are not familiar with the disease, it's um, it has it affects my muscles. In essence, my brain quits communicating with my muscles and the muscles atrophy and, and paralysis sets in and I'm unable to do uh, basic things. Mine has been primarily in my hands um, for the last three years or so. And more so in the last six months, it's begun to affect my legs. <clears throat> to date, I'm still able to talk fairly normally. I do get raspy voiced after a while, but that's probably just because I talk so much because that's about all I do anymore is talk um, online or in person. So the, uh, the de degeneration of the disease in me has been very slow comparatively. Um, I was diagnosed um, a little less than three and a half years ago. And the average prognosis for life after diagnosis is three to five years, with the last couple of years of those years being very uh, immobilized and debilitated and non-functional. So as far as ALS goes, mine is very, very slow progressing, for which I'm thankful. Um, if you've got to have a type of ALS, this is the kind to have, I've been told. Um, but shortly after the diagnosis of ALS, I began to do a thing called Dying Out Loud. Um, it's an organization that we formed wherein I began to talk uh, in person when available and online in podcasts and YouTube shows and things like that about living and dying and about the value of life when confronted with impending death. Um, of necessity, I've had to talk a good, deal, a good deal about death. It's not a subject that a lot of people want to talk about, but I have found that it's a subject that a lot of people need to talk about because it's something, this is a, a shocker and you may want to take notes. This is something that's going to happen to all of us. Yeah, I hate to break that to you, but it is the truth. Um, death is nothing more than the natural result of living. And um, it's okay. It's okay to experience death. In, in fact, it's a necessity. Um, the thing that we have to decide is how we're going to live, how, what we're going to do before that death, because that's the only thing we have control over. And in essence, that's what dying out loud became, um, excuse me, <clears throat> early on, 
in this process, someone sent me a poem called My Soul Has a Hat. It's by a, a Brazilian poet, um, I think circa 1940 or so, named Mario de Andrade. And I won't read the whole poem. Um, I would encourage you to look it up and read it at your leisure. But the final line became kind of a catchphrase for us. In fact, it's um, it's one of the quotes that we put on a T-shirt. We Yeah, we have a merch store. That's the thing you do, right? You have to have a merch store with T-shirts and coffee mugs and all the things, um, the trinkets and trash. So you can get that at, dying out, at DaveOutloud.org. <laughs> um, but the final line of that poem says this. We have two lives, and the second begins when you realize you only have one. And that's a very subtle yet pointed way to say, this is the only life that we know we have. Um, we may, you know, I, I came from an evangelical Christian background. Um, I don't know what many of you are, what you, what you're from. That's why I like, I love meeting people in person and really I'm disappointed that I couldn't be there in person to interact with you personally and t chat with you before and after. Cause I really put great value on that. But, um, a lot of these groups that I've spoken to Oasis, Sunday assembly, Unitarian churches, um, ethical societies, free thought societies, I realize there's a mix of people there. Some of you have come from evangelical Christian backgrounds. Some of you might still identify as a Christian, um, uh, humanist, atheist, agnostic, uh, free thinker, all these labels that we can attach to ourselves, but it's, it's really boils down to what we believe about life and how life works and what our worldview is. Well, I came from the evangelical space, which has a very strict fundamentalist worldview, which says that um, we're all born sinners and that Jesus died for our sins. And only by believing in him can we uh, receive forgiveness for our sins and therefore be right with God because we're born wrong with God. God's mad at us simply for being the virtue of being born. Um, that, that's really the thought process there. God's angry at you. You're a worthless sinner. And how dare you be born into his world? Um, but you were, so you're going to have to get right with him in order to not go to hell and go to heaven. Well, that's a um, horrendous ideology, and it's very uh, harmful. And so my dying out loud work not only began to be about living and dying, but speaking out against these ideas that cause harm, that cause trauma in religious and in people, religious trauma that people deal with years and years later after, even after coming out of that mindset, there's still the, the uh, indoctrination that is embedded deep within our psyche. And uh, we have to do battle against that. I, I speak very forcefully against the evangelical fundamentalist ideology because I do believe it does harm. And so that's the, the journey that I've been on for the last three and a half years and the um, the speaking out about the the quote that I, I shared with you a minute ago uh, from the poem "My Soul Has a Hat" speaks to the idea that there is not an afterlife. This is the one life we have. Now, do I know that for sure? No, I don't know, uh, and that's the point. None of us do. None of us know what's beyond the curtain. We we live our lives the best we can. And then when we go to sleep for that final time, there's no guarantee. Now, the best evidence suggests and the best science suggests that there's nothing beyond the veil, that we go to sleep and we don't wake up. Excuse me. And to that end, when I do talk to groups like this and online, um, I do get a lot of questions about fear of death. Um, what do, I, what do you think happens after Dave? That kind of thing. Because now I'm an expert on death. <laughs> uh, I'm not. But um, uh, I get a lot of questions around it. And we'll have a Q&A here in a minute. And I'm, I welcome any, any of your questions. Because um, there really is no question that's off limits. And there's probably no question that I haven't already been asked. But sometimes in my presentation, I do kind of answer questions that are on your minds 
before you ask them. And one of those inevitably is, are you afraid of death? Um, what do you think happens afterwards? And I do like to speak to that because I do believe that there's an irrational fear of death that can linger in many of us and that many people do deal with a fear of death. Um, it's the great boogie. It's the great boogeyman. It's the, it's the great unknown. It's the big, big bad boogie. Um, when I, when I've broken it down to people in, in simple terms, as I see things, and again, these are just my own observations and my own, um, ideas. I, I haven't researched this. I don't know what the scientific data says about death. Um, but the way I look at it is this, I'm going to go to sleep when this ALS gets to be too much. I'm going to, um, it's going to, it's going to be the end of the life that I've known. It's coming sooner than I thought it would. I, I was always a healthy person. So I thought I would live well into my eighties or, you know, lifespan that's pretty typical these days. But nonetheless, I got dealt this, this hand. Um, I'm going to go to sleep and I'm not going to wake up, but I won't be aware that I didn't wake up. I won't realize, oh my God, I'm dead. Oh my God, I'm, I didn't wake up. I should be awake. I should be with my friends. I should be doing this or doing that. I won't have any awareness of that. So I will just be a non-entity. I will be non-existent just like I was before I was born. And I mean, that's what Mark Twain said. He said, I was dead a long time and it didn't seem to have any uh, negative effect on me. Um, that's really how I look at it. And to that point, it's nothing to be afraid of. There, there's nothing in that scenario that's scary to me. I like sleep. And sometimes when I'm having a good dream and I wake up, I'm disappointed that I woke up and I want to get back to that dream because I was having fun. I was flying or whatever. Um, so going to sleep and not waking up is, is really not a scary thing. Now, what I think, if we really broke it down, what I think people are saying when they're expressing a fear of death is that we have this fear of not living our, to our full potential. We have this dread of not getting everything we can out of life. And there may be some existential fear about the afterlife. If you've, if you've been subjected to these evangelical or fundamentalist ideas, um, excuse me, my voice is <clears throat> difficult today. If you've got these fundamentalist ideas of, of eternity, then yeah, there could be some uh, lingering fear um, of being on the wrong side of that question. Did I do it right? Is God okay with me? Is God going to let me in? When I get up there, is St. Peter going to look at the list and say, mm, dude, I don't see your name here. Well, could you check a different name? I heard someone come on. Um, I, I guess somebody will tell me if I'm running out of time because I don't really watch the time. Um, but there's a fear there, perhaps, from people who have these thoughts of, heaven and hell, even if, and I've found this with Christians, as I've talked about this over the last three years, there's a lot of fear of death in Christians, even though they're supposedly right with God, because in the back of their mind, there's this thought of maybe I did get it wrong. What if I'm wrong and this God is going to send me to hell? Well, it makes a whole lot more sense to deal with life without those ideas, that this life is what we have, and it's up to me to make the most of it. And that is exactly what dying out loud the organization is about. Um, it is our one chance to do the life we want and to live the way we want to live. And we get to decide what that looks like. And what I tell people and what I'll tell you today is you are the one who is the author of your life. There's no God that's directing it. There's no will of God that you have to fit into. There's no plan of God that you have to follow. And there's no pattern that's been set out for you. It's your life and you get to live it. And if you don't like the way that your life is going, if you don't like the story that's being written, then take the pen back from whoever you gave it to and write your own story. 
finish it the way you want. That's exactly what I did when I left evangelical faith behind about 12 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago. Childish Things, the book, the memoir, is about that. It's about me putting away childish things. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians, as the former guy says, that says, when, we, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, and I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So to my evangelical family and friends, that's an offensive title because I'm saying to them, your faith is a childish thing. Well, I guess I am because that mentality, that thinking, that binary thinking, that black and white, good and evil thought process. There's those of us who are good and everyone else is evil. Those, those of us who believe in God are right. Everyone else is wrong. That is childish thinking. And that does need to be put away because it forsakes the gray. It forsakes the nuance that life is full of because very few things are black and white. There is so much gray. There is so much nuance. And when we, when we capitulate to binary thinking, then we forsake the gray and we forsake the nuance and it essentially stops the conversation and that has to stop. So childish things, the, the title of my memoir is me expressing for my personal journey that I did put away childish things. And I look at it like this. I've, I've used this quote attributed to Maya Angelou, one of my favorite people. Um, she says so many wonderful things. And this, this is one of them. Hang on. I'll be right back. I'm back. She says, do the best you can do until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. That is profound in its simplicity. And that is something any of us can do at any point in our lives. That's what I did when I recognized that my belief in God was faulty and that I'd been wrong. And I came to the conclusion that there was no God, there never had been. And all the things that I'd believed in and given my life to were false and in many ways harmful. And when I, when I came to that conclusion and put that aside, I was essentially saying, you know what? I was doing the best I could do and now I know better and now I'm going to try to do better. And that not only has to do with thoughts of God and Satan and heaven and hell and righteousness and salvation. It has to do with things like abortion, um, gay rights, gay marriage, um, climate control, a lot of things that I was on the wrong side of the thinking on back when I was an evangelical, because regardless of what my compassionate nature might dictate, the theology that I had attached myself to said that homosexuality was wrong, was sinful behavior, and these folks needed to be saved. Well, I look at that now, and although I, I was compassionate to the people, I was sending them the message that you're wrong. You're a sinner and you have to be saved. Um, I was on the wrong side of the abortion ask question because I was convinced by my Christian leaders that life begins at conception and you're killing babies. Well, I know now that that was wrong. And I know now that that language is harmful. But I can't go back and undo what I did. I can't go back and unthink what I thought and unsay what I said. All I can do now is recognize that I was wrong, admit that I was wrong, and do better. And I, I, there's incredible power in that. Is there regret? Yes. Uh, another question I've been asked oftentimes is, do you regret the things you said and did when you were an evangelical? I was a pastor many of those years. I was leading people. People were coming to me for answers. <clears throat> Do I regret that? Yeah, but I don't wallow in that regret. I don't live in the in the emotion of regret. It's too costly of an emotion. I recognize the mistake, but like the quote from Maya Angelou says, now I know to do better, so I'm going to do better. 
Now, it does take a bit of courage, and I'm calling myself courageous, and that's okay, because I want to say that to you too. If you've ever changed your mind about significant things, a, a complete shift in your worldview, in your ideology on the tectonic plate shift kind of things, then that took courage to admit you're wrong. It does. And that's a courageous thing. And I want you to recognize that about yourself, that you're a courageous person for acknowledging that you were wrong about dearly held beliefs, as they like to say, my sincerely held beliefs. Well, sincerely held beliefs can change when we gain new information. And that's, they, in fact, they should change because otherwise they're just dogma and dogma does damage. That's a great quote, by the way. It should go on a t-shirt. The um, the Childish Things memoir, um, by the way, you can, uh, I would have had them there if, if we'd have been able to come in person and would be happy to sign them. I will, uh, some of these meetings that I'm doing virtually, I just tell people if you do want to get a, you can get them from Amazon. Um, and I would encourage you, if, if you're interested in any of those deconversion stories and memoirs of people who've, there's plenty of them out there, but there's none of them as good as mine. I'm just going to tell you. Now, uh, of course, I'm kidding, but um, it did come out well. and I'm very pleased with it. So I think you will enjoy the read. If you do want a signed copy, then you can email me at our DaveOutloud.org website. You'll find the ad, the email address is DaveOutloud at gmail.com. And request a signed copy, and we'll coordinate with you on that. Uh, it'll take some time. We're going to be... Um, out a lot, traveling some other places, uh, but we'll get to it as soon as we can. So just coordinate with us on that. Um, but the book is just the story of my entry into and out of evangelicalism. And I do like to make sure that I point out when I'm talking about Christian faith, especially to groups like yours, that I'm very distinctive about the kind of faith that I'm talking about, the, the tribe, if you will, because I recognize that there are many, many differences. Um, there are some kinds of faith, <clears throat> excuse me, even Christian faith that are less damaging than others. Um, benign kinds of faith, faith that says, I believe in a God or I believe in something, but I'm not going to try to impose that upon you. Um, and I, I'm okay largely with that. Uh, obviously, I, my my position is I kind of echo um, what John Lennon said. He was already quoted once today. I, I like that, um, that the world would be better without religion. Imagine no religion. I think it's a better world if we just look at things materially and uh, rationally and not not believing in something out there other than what we see and know is true. But if that's not your journey and not your story. The the dangerous kind that I see is the is the um, kind that is uh, imposing itself on others and trying to force individuals or society at a, at, as a whole to believe a certain way and to think a certain way. That's not okay, and that's exactly what we're seeing happen in this country right now. The surge of Christian nationalism, the uh, movement toward, I'm just gonna call it Christo-fascism and a theocracy. There are, there are people at work in the, in the country now that want this country to be a theocracy. And I tell people, if you want a theocracy, go over to the Muslim countries and you'll see what that looks like. Um, that's not what we want. That's not what this country, is or was ever supposed to be. So we have to push back against that. And that's the language that I, I'm very careful to use when I'm talking to religious groups or to any kind of secular group or any kind of group that has to do, that forms around ideology, is I'm speaking against fundamentalism in, its, in all of its forms because that's the kind that tries to impose its force, impose its will on people. And those are the people who are at the abortion clinics telling the girls that they're killing their babies. Those are the people that are, that are trying to pass laws that 
do damage to people and take away our, our basic human rights. Those are the people who were behind the overturning of Roe v. Wade. That's the danger of what's going on in the country. And that's why I speak out like I do as much as I can, as long as I can, because I'm very much opposed to that. And sadly, that's um, my uh, the best, the biggest part of my family, my extended family, siblings, mom, some of my kids um, are very much enmeshed in that uh, ideology. And so it puts me at odds with them. Um, and it has cost me a great deal relationally because they are not happy about what I'm saying. Well, I'm not happy about what they're doing. So we're kind of at odds here. Uh, would it be better for me with my family relationships if I just shut up, mind my own business? Yeah. The price is too high though. The cost is too great. And the stakes are too, too high in this country right now, especially more so than any time in my lifetime. Um, so no, I, I can't afford to be quiet. I won't be quiet and I will speak up even though it costs me these relationships. Um, and I'm not saying that's what you've got to do, but I do think that we all need to take a look at what, what we're doing, how we're, how we're approaching things. Um, if I, I know a lot of people who've deconverted from their Christian faith, but are still in the closet and their family doesn't know it. Their friends don't know it. I am being a little more forceful these days in saying to those people, and you may be there too, some of you, is, is it okay for you to remain in the closet and for your friends and family to think one way about you when the truth is the opposite? Is, is it time to come out of the closet? Uh, are the stakes high enough where you need to raise your voice and say, no, I'm not okay with this. This is not who I am. This is not what I want this country to be. Questions, food for thought. So I'm, I'm going to um, pause now. I think it's close to the time that I can, I like to leave as much time for Q&A as possible because I do also, I get a lot of questions about death. And I want to make sure that I leave um, time for that because a lot of the questions have to do with um, how we die in this country, um, die, death with dignity, the lack of laws that make that okay in this country. Uh, I am a, a, a strong proponent of us being able to end things on our own terms, in our own way, when the time comes. Um, ALS will, if I let it go to its natural conclusion, it will take everything from me. It will it it will render me completely useless and unable to to eat uh, by myself, to dress myself, to do anything by myself. And I'm not willing, personally, for that that part. Hang on, I'm going to check a message here to make sure I'm doing the time right. Because normally I would just have folks yell at me to shut up. Um. Okay. Um. In terms of my death, personally, I, I've, I've always said that when the losses outweigh the gains, when the wins are, are fewer than the, than the losses and every day is nothing but a struggle to exist, I don't see a quality of life there that would compel me to try to stay alive longer. I, to me, it's not about the and this is sound like a cliche, and it, it, it is, I guess. It's not about the quantity of my days. It's about the quality of my days. And I'm not interested in living as long as I can and existing as long as I can. I'm, I'm interested in enjoying life as long as I can. As long as I feel like there's good and things to, to be gained by me living and, and things that I can contribute. And as long as I can talk like this, I'll probably be okay with staying around. But when that becomes too much of a challenge and there's just no point in anything, I don't see any reason that we have to keep me alive at that point. And so, yes, I'm very much a, a proponent of having options when that time comes. Let me see what are we doing here. Okay. He'll tell me when the Q&A starts. So the 
the quality of life, the dignity and death, the, the way that we, excuse me, the way that we force and impose our, a, a lot of the laws in this country are in place because of religious underpinnings. The idea that you can't, I, I, I get people to tell me all the time, you can't play God. You have to, uh, God, God gives life and God takes it away. That's the idea in many people's minds about what living and dying is, that God gave you breath and God will take it away when he's done with you. Well, my response to that has been and is, if that's true, then God is a sadistic thug. If he's the one that forces people to stay alive for years and years when when their their body has given out and they have no interest in, in staying alive, there's no quality of life there and they're just existing. If that's God keeping them alive because he's not done with them yet, then he's a sadistic thug. And I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. And I don't think that's okay. So I'm very much a proponent of people having options when, when those times are done. And my, she's, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so I, um, I do have one thought. I got it. I'm sorry. This is very distracting. So I, um, I, I ended up, I ended up just deciding to write the book after I got ALS. I wasn't going to write my memoir because I thought, well, there's a, a, a thousand deconversion story memoirs out there. And I didn't think the world needed one more. <coughs> Excuse me. My voice is, is really struggling here. Um, but once I got diagnosed with ALS, I, um, I thought, you know what, this, this story and the living and the dying part of it and the, the idea of a life that we choose to live on the terms that with the, ter the way that we choose to live it in our, under our own terms is, is worth talking about. And the, the messages I've gotten once I started doing the dying out loud work and started going on a lot of shows and, and, and speaking out about these things, living and dying. Um, the messages I started getting were from people who were encouraged to and inspired was the word I got a lot to make more of their life, to get up from their depression or their um, physical struggles. Um, I started getting messages from people who were dealing with really serious life challenges and had given up essentially on life. And me talking about my journey and my um, effort to make the most of my life and to, to live fully to the phrase that I began to use, and I hope it's okay to say this in your, in your group, is carpe the fucking diem. Make the most out of everything that you can. Grab all the moments. It's all about the moments. And so when I started talking about that and people started, I guess, hearing that if the, the idea was, if I can do it, if I can pursue life with vigor, dealing with ALS and having my body give up on me, if I can get up every day and find the moments, then I can too. If Dave can do it, I can do it. Um, th this is a funny story that kind of developed into a, uh, I don't know, inspirational kind of thing. Er early on in, in the diagnosis, shortly after the diagnosis, uh, the group that I was a part of in Nashville, we had an ex-Christian atheist group that met regularly and uh, we were meeting shortly after the diagnosis and everyone was kind of processing how they were reacting to my diagnosis and getting the news that I'd just been handed a death warrant, a, 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 a diagnosis. And one of my friends was talking about her running some errands that week and, and saying that she was frustrated about this and that and was just the petty annoyances of life that we all have. And she stopped herself and thought, I shouldn't be thinking this way. Dave is dealing with so much more and he wouldn't be caught up in the frustrations of the 
trivia of life and and you know why am i doing this and someone else in the room said yeah what would dave do and and then someone else said yeah wwdd and 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 then i said well we should have bracelets because there used to be a wwjd bracelet what would jesus do we should have what would dave do bracelets because that's how big my ego is and um so we laughed and we had a big joke and she said yeah let's do that she says i do some bracelets for i make bracelets for etsy and we can do that so we started making these wwjd bracelets or wwdd bracelets and um people started ordering them and it was a very surreal moment when i got a picture and a message from a, a man in paris france who was wearing a wwdd bracelet and and he said i'm gonna have this on every day and what it does it it excuse me it reminds me to stay focused on what really matters and to not get caught up in what doesn't matter and to focus on what we have right now this day and not let the fear of tomorrow or the regret from yesterday influence what i'm living right now and for that i've been very thankful that i've been able to help people process life a little bit better and that's that's been everything for me that's it's been an incredible part of the journey and i'm very thankful for it Thank you. So um, we have a couple of announcements to make. One is that Skepticon is this weekend. We have a booth that will be set up if you would like to promote the Ethical Society by handing out flyers and talking about our community. There's a sign-up sheet at the back at the welcome table. All are welcome. You do not have to commit to the whole weekend. Also, local honey is being sold in the Becker Room today. All proceeds will go to the International Institute to benefit immigrants from Ukraine and other countries. And I believe James has a couple of announcements.